Welcome to the Animal Rights Show Tribute Edition. Yay. And we each picked out a highlight clip that we think um, represents the show well. And really, um, I know what this show has brought me is just uh, helped bring the community together. I mean, I think in these um, strange times we live in, we, it, it can be quite easy to feel a bit detached and isolated from things, not being able to attend those usual events um, and social gatherings. And yeah, getting together for these Zoom calls has been a great way to pull us together. And I think there's also a lot of really complicated topics that I know I'm keen to explore more myself, and I think others are too, which is really what the show's done for me. For my clip, uh, we were talking about probably one of my favorite subjects, which is language. And this was towards the end of a really robust discussion. And there's, we've been using question prompts to help pull the conversation back to some key themes uh, to make sure you know, things stay on topic. And we were reluctant um, and had some internal dialogue as a team whether or not to include this prompt. And in the end, I'm glad we did because I think it was my favorite contribution of the day. And um, it's from someone who actually became a, a later team member of ours, Sarah, and really highlighted to me a, a key thing that I think doesn't get enough attention um, and that's ableism awareness. And what it, the, the part of this clip that really stood out to me is that our language should never deny someone their existence, be it human or um, one of our fellow animals. And it really highlights that um, commonality between human and other animal oppression. But also I know for me, I'm trying to learn more about being respectful of my language, both for other animals as well as humans. It helped me to be more mindful to do just that. So with that, I'll let the clip speak for itself. Yeah, on the topic of, of these terms, in a lot of the reasons why people would give, you know, you know, they'd say, oh, they don't mean anything by saying these terms. And I think it does really come down to understanding that people really don't often don't understand why the word is hurtful as opposed to offensive. Um, similar to what Roger was saying, like a lot of people think people are just getting offended by things, but the, the hurt is very, very real. And it's like with ableism, the world doesn't really um, allow people with different abilities a space in existence as it is they're always you know um denied their reality so then when they go out and they hear people you know using these words jokingly at their friends like saying oh you're an idiot or in ireland it's really like words like spastic and handicapped are so used just regularly so i had a brother who grew up hearing people he was to say he's disabled and he grew up hearing people using these terms and he was like why is my existence an insult because, you know, those words are meant to mean just, you know, to define their um, abilities, but they're being used as insults. So he grew up um, with an understanding that his very existence was used as an insult. So, you know, what it creates in later life is like a complete um, misunderstanding of where you belong in the world, which, which people with disabilities already can have because there's very little, um, you know, space for them as it is so I think it's really important but even me growing up with two family members who have extreme disabilities I even use ableist language it's like so ingrained in everything and you really really have to work on like um checking yourself and making sure that the words you're using aren't literally denying someone's you know existence in the world so yeah it's really interesting isn't it because uh, that was just part of the show that was comp completely spontaneous and it left everybody going wow you know, is that's that's one of the the things that these shows do. You know, which is a great a, a great thing. You never you never, you never know what's going to happen, and that that was one of the most powerful things that we all remember. So one of my uh, favourite clips from the show, I think this is one of the first uh, shows that we did, if not the first. So in the clip you're about to see, uh, we have Roger who is talking about the the movement's messaging and the lack of clarity in that messaging. So what you'll see in the clip is Roger claiming that the animal rights movement does not advocate for the rights of animals. And at first, this is quite striking. Um, but when we consider the typical messaging that is projected from the movement, largely welfare focused, um, that striking claim starts to make sense. Roger goes on to highlight how certain groups are, um, who are certainly not for advocating for the rights of animals, yet they are perceived by the popular mind as an animal rights group. And I think a distinction between rights and welfare is really important to make. Uh, and this clip stands out to me in starting to clarify that distinction. So 
here it is. I don't really um, agree that we can talk about the existing movement as the animal rights movement because it's not. Uh, it's, it's like saying PETA is an animal rights organization, which a lot of people would say, but that's not true. So um, it would um, it'd be, it'd be important to, um, to not kind of, uh, this is a non-species term, no, no, we shouldn't over, over egg that, you know, we should be more, more honest about it. So in, in terms of the idea of animal rights broadly defined, you know, which some people use, I would tend to say, if I'm talking about the whole movement, I tend to talk about the animal advocacy movement. You know, so Francion would then say, well, in that case, we've got the animal confusion mo movement because it's, it's utterly confused in terms of its philosophical uh, grounding. And to, to include everything that goes on in the movement from the RSPCA uh, along to wherever as the animal rights movement is just wrong. Groovy. That's really the whole idea behind the show, isn't it? Kind of re-inject re rights back into the animal movement. There you go. Well, be before I start, I want to refute Brad's suggestion just now that I made sense at any given time. Um, but uh, my uh, my clip um, uh, involves someone who's been involved with the movement since 1972, been a vegan since 1972, and seen a lot of changes o over the time. And we were trying to um, talk about um, something that comes up in social movement theory, which is that when more uh, a movement becomes more and more mainstream, there is a threat to the core values of the movement. Now, this is something that is causes a bit of kind of it's interesting really because obviously every movement wants to become mainstream or at least grow and you know become a kind of mass movement at the same time this is the very thing that might actually threaten some of the core values so that's the kind of core idea um to what uh, ronnie lee says here yeah i think that's like a kind of um i mean roger probably agree with me it's like a kind of sort of sociological a uh, reason why this has been kind of been this change in, in, in the vegan movement um, where a lot of people are uh, a political, you know, a lot of people are kind of identifying themselves as right wing, for instance, now, or I would not, not the majority, but perhaps a, substan a substantial minority. Um, in, in, the early, in the early days, you know, when the kind of animal rights movement started kind of getting going in this country in the uh, 1970s into the 80s, um, it was really difficult to live as a vegan. It, it was it was uh, uh, it was almost impossible to eat out. It was not easy to get vegan products, and so um, people that that became vegan tended to be um, already already radical people that kind of weren't worried about being um, kind of part of society, um, weren't worried about being kind of normal people so to speak so, so a lot of other ideas kind of went with veganism for instance anarchism like lots of vegans were anarchists in those days you know it, was, it tended to be like a very very left-wing movement in its thinking because of that because people um you know were you know were were unconventional didn't want to be conventional uh but i think now because it's kind of so it's it's so easy now to to live as a vegan that people that aren't so uh, radical in other ways don't set themselves apart from society in other ways um kind of have become vegan at least in terms of um consuming a vegan diet and i think that may be one of the reasons why we've seen this kind of uh, we've seen this kind of change in, in 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 politics in the movement so what do you think roger do you think the movement becoming more mainstream is a risk well that's what social movement theory says actually jeremy but um because it, it, it's not, it's not, I mean, we're not just talking about our movement. We talk about social movements in general, you know, and they do kind of um, de-radicalize, they moderate, they professionalize, all those things. Uh, some people might say are inevitable, you know, in the linear growth of a movement, but uh, every step of the way, that's a threat to the core values. And we, we are seeing that a little bit in the vegan movement, which is uh, an interest uh, of mine. And it's something we've talked about in the show as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it is always a threat, but it's almost like an inevitable development at the same time. Yeah, and our movement being particularly unique, isn't it? Because the ones we're truly advocating on behalf of and solidarity with aren't necessarily part of the core movement. 
Well, you know, they can't besides, tell us you know, that we're getting it wrong, can they? That's, that's the interesting thing. They can't <laughs> say, you know, you, you're, you're advocating for me wrongly. They can't do that. Yeah, that's interesting. That. That's we can Roger, amplify their voices, the better. Roger, do you think on, on the topic of de-radicalization, do you think that's um, we see that in effect with the national groups when it comes to their donor pools, uh, weakening the message in order to widen their donor pools and things like that? It's a, it's a kind of um, pressure on national groups. You know, when they professionalized, they ended up getting a lot of people uh, with wages. And therefore, then they've got to be careful that they can sustain themselves. And so that then means that their donor base uh, might need to be quite wide. And in terms of the vegan movement, there might not be enough vegans to sustain a, a large uh, amount of staff. So that tension is kind of built into this particular movement. It reminds me of when um, you get rock bands or cult bands and they're very kind of you know they have certain values and a certain edge to them and then as soon as they get popular they go mainstream and they lose it and and all the all the original fans absolutely hate them <laughs> so, oh, so yeah. saying, we're, ba we're, we're basically a rock band <laughs> yeah well i've chosen i've chosen a couple of clips actually so um the first one i chose is um from one of our earlier episodes in in the series in which roger is talking about the focus and, and scope um, of, of the animal rights movement. And um, so you picked on me again, Tom. I picked, this what I picked on you again. <laughs> um, but I found this particular um, kind of explanation, Roger, really helpful um, in terms of understanding where our movement sits um, amongst other social justice movements. And um, that there is, there is, that our focus is always going to be on advocating for the, the, the rights of animals. But as part of that, we are part of a, a wider social justice movement and the scope is always um, showing solidarity and um, respect for other, other humans as well and other um, human rights activists who are doing similar work in, 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 in our space. And um, I do feel personally that it's important for us to show solidarity with, with those groups and work with them. Um, and yeah, so I take kind of heart from that knowing that we're part of this bigger kind of collective group of, of individuals who are um, on the same, the same path. I think the people who often claim that, you know, the other animals need, need their own movement and um, they, they need um, a movement to concentrate on their well-being and, uh, and in our, our, our terms, the, um, the respect for their rights. They, they, kind of, they kind of create a, a problem, I think, which is not really there in, in the sense that uh, if you look at the, the history of the vegan society, you, you could understand it, especially with the work of uh, Leslie Cross, you could understand it in terms of focus and scope. So it is true that the vegan social movement has have always been focused on human relations with other animals, but that's never been the scope of it. And so it seems to me that um, some of the things that uh, some of maybe the newer activists uh, complain about is a problem that they've almost like manufactured. It's not really, not really there and it never has been. But, you know, from my point of view, it's all, always been intertwined or entangled in David Nybert's sense. So, you know, um, the activists that I've always known have been interested and engaged in, in both issues all the time. And it's just been seen as a, a kind of natural thing, which is something that Reagan emphasizes over and over again in his work. Well, that has the potential of addressing a pretty big internal dialogue within the movement right now, doesn't it? Because I think a lot of people think it's a threat when really, if we acknowledge, I think a lot of yeah. people, you know, want to keep the focus. Well, I think pretty much everyone wants to keep the focus on other animals. It's just at a minimum being respectful of human issues. That's yeah. really all it takes. It takes it's it's takes bizarre though, isn't it? Because um, what's being perceived as a, as, as a weakness and a threat is actually a strength. And mm. it's always been there. You mm. know, there's been some new terminology that's brought into the movement, but that idea has always been there. I must say, as someone who, in my earlier days in the movement, did see intersectionality as a negative, um, the idea of focus and scope uh, cleared it up for me um, and really makes it quite simple, to be honest, simple to understand. Yeah, I, I agree that the, the focus and scope has really helped me to get that clear as well. And I feel a lot of the resistance in the movement too. Um, and I don't even feel, and I know we, we've chatted about this as well, that, that intersectionality might even be the wrong term for what we talk about. And we think more about maybe David Nybert's entanglements because it's intertwined and interwoven rather than just a cross section. Um, 
And I think the resistance to that kind of uh, looking at uh, human issues as well as other animal issues is because people think it's going to take away um, the focus on other animals. And so I think it's often a misunderstanding of that. And, and so I think uh, Roger's clarification of the focus and scope has, has really helped me get that very clear in my own mind as well. And, and it helps me to explain it to other people as well. So that's been very, very useful. Thanks, Roger. Looks like You're you welcome. might have come up with something useful, Roger. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just waiting around for somebody to find it useful. <laughs> so for my, my second clip, um, I've really enjoyed um, the numerous conversations we've had around language, which Jeremy, Jeremy's touched on, and the kind of exploration of the impact and the linguistic um, tools that our language has and the weight that that carries and what that means for certain people. And I know it's, the word is ethnomodology, I believe how people <laughs> how people receive certain words that we say. And um, the one thing that I would encourage all people watching this um, these clips is, please, if you can, check yourself when you're referring to other animals as it. Um, it's one little thing that we can do. And, and you know, um, referring to animals as he or she, they just gives so much more power and weight to the, our advocacy um, and, and revering them as individuals. But this quote, this clip that I want to show is just um, was, um, I, th I think it was early on in one of our episodes in which um, we were exploring the, the different words, use and exploitation. And I really enjoyed Brad's take um, on the, the, the kind of power that, that using the word exploitation may have as opposed to using the word use and how we casually, as society as humans, use various objects. But when we exploit other beings it can mean so much more and i think brad really encapsulates that and uh i kind of find it funny how we finished it on the end as well but i'll leave that for you to enjoy so obviously society views animals as objects um, wrongly and it's and some things you can use objects so you can use a car you can use a chair but you can't exploit objects you can't exploit a car you can't exploit tables and chairs but you can exploit um, other animals. So to me, that kind of is a point in favor of animal exploitation over use. I definitely agree that they're both better than suffering, abuse, torture, cruelty, because they're very subjective and imply welfare. And uh, yeah, but uh, I, I am in camp exploitation. <laughs> Blimey, I, I don't think anyone's ever enjoyed my take before. So thank you, Tom. <laughs> Yeah, the, the end bit, the end bit is, is funny because Brad declares himself to be in the exploitation camp. <laughs> I could have worded it better, yeah. So the clip I've chosen was taken from the show that ran the day after um, animal rights activist Regan Russell was run over and killed by a truck outside of a Fearman's Pork slaughterhouse in Burlington in Canada. Um, she was there to peacefully protest and bear witness to the pigs that were being brought there to be killed. Um, so this affected me very much. And let me give you a little context on why. The day before um, Regan was killed, I had been at a protest myself in Ramsgate against the live export of our fellow animals. And during the protest, it was made very clear to activists to be really careful when the trucks came uh, because they weren't guaranteed to stop if you got in their way. And it got me thinking about Jill Phipps, um, another activist who was killed by a truck on a similar protest um, at an airport in Coventry in February 1995. And Jill was literally on my mind all day. Um, and I was imagining how it would be if one of my friends who were here with me at this protest were to get killed and I were to witness that. And it was a very emotional day anyway, as these things are, and especially when the trucks showed up and you know you see all the individuals on the trucks and it, the reality of why you're there hits you hard. Um, and I was very mindful of the trucks, but did come close to being run over by a car that had no intentions of slowing down at a roundabout, as did another activist. So when the news of Regan's death came the next day, it just really hit me. I felt somehow connected to that because of everything that I'd been thinking about the day before and everything that happened. And I didn't know Regan personally, but I did attend an event in her memory and learn a lot about her. And she was a very committed activist who dedicated her time to advocating for justice for other animals. But she also got involved in other movements fighting injustice, such as Black Lives Matter. And one thing that someone who knew her well said about her was that whenever she was at an event, 
she was always the person who would welcome new activists and be so friendly to everyone. So she was warm and compassionate and full of empathy for others, whatever their species. And I feel like she is a real loss to our movement. Um, and we all felt on the Animal Rights Show, we felt really strongly that we should stand in solidarity with Regan. And so we decided to hold a minute silence for her on the show the next day. And the clip is um, of Seb Alex giving a beautiful introduction um, and a tribute to Regan and an introduction to the silence. I found it very moving and very powerful. For those of you who don't know, just a quick summary of what happened yesterday. Uh, an activist in Canada was killed during a vigil outside a slaughterhouse. Um, her name was uh, Regan Russell. She was 65 years old. She's been active in animal rights since 1977. She was arrested 11 times for acts of civil disobedience to help animals. She was at marine land protests. She stood up for sled dogs recently trespassing to expose their exploitation. She protested on behalf of sexual assault victims against Bill Cosby when he was speaking in Hamilton. Uh, she attended the Black Lives Matter protest in Hamilton very recently, and she went to vigils every single Sunday. Um, unfortunately, we lost her yesterday, and um, this is not the first time that this happens. Uh, we also have had similar things in the past with Jill Phipps, 31 years old. She was killed um, while protesting against live exports in the UK in front of her mother. Police was there as well. Truck driver was never um, held guilty for what happened. Tom Warby, who was 15 years old, Hansab was killed by a hunter, and Mike Hill as well. Um, that being said, uh, we're going to take a, a one minute long silence um, in memory of Regan Russell. Thank you. <laughs> 